Hello, this is Dr. Mark Goldston, and I am pleased to be speaking to you as part of the Goldsmith Knowledge Philanthropy Community. Marshall Goldsmith is possibly the best known executive coach in the world, and he has started a community where he is going to give away for free all the knowledge he's accumulated in life. And it's an immense amount of knowledge, and he's inviting other people to do the same to share our knowledge. So instead of worrying about how to get paid for something in this difficult world that we find ourselves in, why not just give it away if it'll help people, if it'll help one person? So this is one episode in my contributing to that community. And what I'm going to be talking to you about is recapturing hope. A little of my background is I was a psychiatrist for 40 years, and I specialized in suicide prevention. And I was fortunate that none of my patients died by suicide, but I've spent many years trying to figure out what it was that helped them. And I think what helped them was giving them a way to recapture hope. Uh, what you're going to see along with my talking about this is you're going to see an infographic called Recapturing Hope designed by Brian O'Mara Croft at Visual Congruence. So you'll be hearing my voice, but you'll be seeing that infographic as I go over it. First, a couple words about Visual Congruence. That's the name of his company. Uh, what drew me to Brian and Visual Congruence is a concept called sense of coherence. Sense of coherence was a concept first coined by Aaron Antonovsky. And what he said is that when you take something that is confusing, chaotic inside someone's mind and you make it comprehensible, it becomes manageable. And when it becomes manageable, people calm down. And when, in addition to that, it's meaningful, uh, it adds to a sense of optimism. So I'm going to be describing what goes on that causes people to be able to recapture hope. The first thing is I'll be talking about how they lose hope. Uh, uh, but, the but what I'm going to first describe to set the foundation is the neuropsychology of dealing with stress and then recapturing hope. When we're under stress, our brain triggers our adrenal glands to release a hormone called cortisol. Cortisol readies our body to deal with stress. And we need that high level of cortisol to be able to do that. But then what happens is the higher that cortisol the more it can re-trigger our brain and a part of our brain called the amygdala, which is in the emotional part of our brain, and it can trigger the amygdala to do something called an amygdala hijack. And what that means is that when we are really stressed, when we cross over into distress, we lose the focus of where we're moving towards and we just focus on relieving the distress and then what happens is the amygdala hijacks us away from being able to think our way through it and consider options. Uh, and it does this actually by sending a signal to shift the blood flow from our higher thinking brain to our lower survival brain. And we're not thinking very clearly. And the expression deer in headlights is actually when an amygdala hijack has happened and a deer is actually literally frozen in the headlights, but that also happens to human beings who can go into a state of fight or flight or freeze. But there's something that counteracts that. And what counteracts that is when someone bonds with us, someone connects with us when we're in that deep state. Now, if you're familiar with my work, you'll know that um, in my book, Just Listen, I coined a term called the mirror neuron gap. 
what is the mirror neuron gap? Well, what are mirror neurons? Mirror neurons were first discovered in macaque monkeys, and they were first referred to as monkey see, monkey do neurons, because what they noticed is they were activated, these mirror neurons, uh, whenever a monkey would imitate another monkey or even a primate. And what happened is they're seen to be associated with imitation learning and empathy. In fact, people who may be on the spectrum uh, are noted to have some dysfunction in their mirror neuron capability. So they're not able to mirror other people. Well, in my book, Just Listen, what I talked about was the greater the mirror neuron gap. In other words, the more we mirror the world, the more we care about the world, but the more the world doesn't care about us in return, the greater the gap. And that can be increased when people are uh, bullying us, when they're talking down to us, when they're critical, when they're sarcastic. But it can be narrowed when people empathize with us, when people show compassion, when people connect with us. Or as I talked about in my book, Just Le Listen, when people cause you to feel felt. And so what happens is when someone causes you to feel felt, the mirror neuron gap goes down, oxytocin goes up. When you're feeling felt by another person, your oxytocin goes up. When that happens, cortisol goes down. So that stress hormone lowers. And when that happens, the amygdala hijack settles down. So that part of your brain no longer needs to hijack you away from being able to think. And while this is happening, there's a release of another neurochemical called dopamine. And dopamine is associated with pleasure. So when we go from feeling stressed out to someone caring about us, we not only feel close, we feel pleasure. And the combination of closeness, pleasure, and stress lessening allows us to think blood flow goes back to our upper brain and we're able to consider options. Now, what you're going to see now as part of the infographic explaining this is you'll see that as we go through life and we're just moving forward, we occasionally run into things that block us that cause us stress. And that can be something that blocks us from the outside or it can be something from inside ourselves. And when we're under stress, we can still focus on our goals. It, it takes a lot more effort, but we're still able to do it. Uh, but when the stress becomes overwhelming, we become distressed. And when we become distressed, our focus goes away from focusing on our goals to how do we eliminate or lessen the distress. And so we try various things to lessen the distress. We'll drink more, we'll eat more, we'll hide out in our apartment, we'll yell at people. Uh, but what happens is it may give us temporary relief. It may give us some relief to overeat, to drink too much, to take drugs. But as the world moves past us, because we're no longer able to move towards our goal, uh, the distress becomes more and we start to develop fear. And from the fear, we can develop anxiety. So fear may have a focus on, oh, I, I'm, I, I haven't gone to work or I haven't checked in with work for a couple of days. But then that can increase the anxiety in which it's not any particular thing. You're just anxious uh, about everything. And the anxiety of falling behind and not knowing how to catch up can then cross over into depression. And if we begin to feel really depressed, we can start to feel discouraged. Now, in my work with suicidal patients over the years, something that I noticed that nearly all of them felt at the moment they became suicidal or started to feel suicidal is they felt despair. And if you break the word despair into D-E-S-P-A-I-R, they feel unpaired with reasons to live. 
They feel hopeless, unpaired with a future, helpless, unable to help themselves, powerless, uh, worthless, useless, meaningless, purposeless. And when those all come together, pointless, pointless to go on. And what do they do? They pair with death to take the pain away. Uh, but they don't immediately go there from despair. What happens is they start to literally feel unglued. It feels like their mind is falling apart. And when they feel unglued, that anxiety turns into high anxiety and the high anxiety turns into panic and the panic can make them feel that the next step is they're just going to shatter like a windshield uh, uh, that's in an accident and it shatters, but it's still holding together. The, the next step is people actually feel that they could fragment. So imagine that cracked automobile windshield it shattered, but it hasn't fragmented. And it's at that point that a number of people, especially veterans, feel that they're losing their mind or they've lost their mind. They're never going to get it back. And while they still have energy, it's at that point where they begin to think, I just want to die because they don't think they're going to come back. And, uh, and it's also at that point, and this is especially true for veterans, when they'll be holding a, literally a gun to their head, when they, if they don't pull the trigger, when they'll discover God, and they might say uh, with, uh, uh, as they're sobbing, God, I don't want to kill myself. I don't want to die, but I can't take the pain anymore. And as they connect with God or God connects with them, they feel this surge of oxytocin. And what happens is if they don't pull the trigger, they just start to cry and they're able to let go of control. But in their mind, they've let go of control into the healing power of God. Now, it doesn't have to be God that you can surrender to, that you can surrender this control to. It can be a, uh, it can be a therapist, if you're fortunate. It can be a family member. It can be someone who can actually help you heal uh, uh, from all the feelings that you plummeted through. And what happens is as you begin to connect with whatever you're connecting with or whoever you're connecting with, you begin to feel relief. And as you begin to feel relief and you're crying your way through it, you begin to inhale. You begin to exhale. And you keep doing that and you start to feel relief. And what's going on is the oxytocin has built up. And uh, what's happening because of that, the blood flow is starting to go back to your upper brain. So you're be, being able to start think. And so you've gone from unglued to reorganized. It literally feels like your brain and mind are coming back together again. And as they start to become reorganized, it's almost like your mind and brain sort of reconfigure. You're, you're looking at the world through different eyes, but better eyes. You're looking, through the, you're looking at the world through the eyes that say, you know, uh, I can live with this. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I can live with this. And the reason you feel you can live with this is because you've had that experience of bottoming out and then connecting to or feeling connected to by someone else or something else that you were able to lean into. And as you begin to sort of feel your mind and brain go from unglued to glued and reconfigure, you start to feel hope. You start to feel, well, I... I don't know exactly what I'm going to do next, but I feel like whatever it is, I can handle it. And you begin to feel encouraged. And you actually feel sort of transformed. I mean, you don't recognize the new you that's going to survive, but it's certainly different from the you that plummeted from being distressed and fell apart. And what happens is when you feel transformed like that, you start to feel determined. 
And so when something bad happens to you, having had this experience of internalizing, whether it's God, whether it's a, uh, the love of a therapist or a friend or a coach, there's something about internalizing that that shored you up uh, and gave you a solid feeling deep inside yourself. And so what happens in the future is that when you start to run into obstacles and you start to feel stress, uh, it may start to head towards distress, but you're able to reach inside yourself uh, and re-experience this feeling that you've had by going through this journey and what you develop is something called eustress, E-U-S-T-R-E-S-S. That's the kind of stress that makes us stronger, smarter, more resilient, wiser. I'll actually end with a story that I remember. It's a little bit dated. It's really dated. And it has to do with Tiger Woods. And it was the 1997 Masters. And, uh, and he shot 40 on the front nine of the 1997 Masters. Uh, and he turned to his father. He didn't say, I want to die. He basically said, the wheels are coming off. I don't know what to do. And what his father, who we had this wonderful relationship with, said to him is, Tiger, you've been here hundreds of times before. Just do what you need to do. Tiger internalized that. And then he went on to shoot a score of 18 under par for the Masters, which has never been equaled again. And that shows you that not only are we capable when we run into stress and we become distressed and we fall apart, not, not only can we recapture hope, we can sometimes become better than we ever were and better than we thought we could become. So I hope that's helpful and you can certainly review this and what we would encourage you to do is go through it, go through it with anybody uh, that you feel is going through it. Because when you get them to start to talk about all those different stages, get them to tell you, are they feeling distressed? Are they feeling afraid? Are they feeling depressed? Get them to talk it out. And when they're able to do that, using the visual congruence of this wonderful graphic that Brian O'Mara Croft created, they're gonna get a sense of coherence. They're gonna take that chaos and that confusion and they're gonna feel that they can comprehend that they're on some sort of a journey. Yes, they'll fall apart, but they get through it and they get better and that'll make it manageable and meaningful. Well, to be able to go through that pain, get through to the other side and become stronger, more resilient and wiser doesn't get much more meaningful than that. So I hope you found this helpful and we'll be sharing more uh, episodes like this as part of the Goldsmith knowledge philanthropy community and until then take good care and please feel free to contact us if we can be a further help and please feel free to share this with anyone you think that it can help take good care